Tonight, I'm very pleased that Fanula Moss, Solicitor, Senior Lecturer at Law, will be talking about recent developments in the use of expert evidence in criminal and care proceedings and loss of expert immunity. At least my eyesight's work, work at the minute. So, uh, without further ado, Fanula Moss, thank you very much. Right, now for a moment I'd like you to think about truth. What is truth? We thought we knew the truth about Hillsborough. We thought we knew the truth about Jimmy Savile. We thought we knew the truth about what was in our lasagna. <laughs> but we didn't. So the truth is dependent upon information being given to us. And this government particularly is one of the most secretive governments we have. We've got limits on Freedom of Information Act notices now for the Dean vexatious. We've got limits, as you know, on coroner's courts. We've got judicial review under threat. Why? So truth is an important commodity because it's only through the truth that we obtain justice. And justice is what has to be decided and given in courts all over the land every day. So the courts are actually charged with deciding this rather ephemeral thing called truth, dependent upon the information before it. And that's why it's very important, clearly, that the information before it is fair and is only on things that the rules of evidence actually deem to be fair. You'll remember that we have in this country, Scotland it doesn't, but everywhere else, we have an adversarial system, which means it's like a duel. It's like the old jousting. The two parties fight, literally, to the death. But there has to be some form of fairness between the parties. So that's where the rules of evidence come in. You're only supposed to hear admissible evidence. What is going to be admissible? It must be relevant to facts. Clearly, if you have lots of things that fudge the issue, distort the issue, barristers, solicitors, they can be magicians. We've also got the fact that expert evidence must in fact be needed. It could be argued that we've got 80% of all care orders last year were on parental neglect in the care courts. It could well be argued, surely a judge or magistrate alone could decide whether or not we have a negligent parent on the facts before them. So therefore, at a strong stroke, we could get rid of all experts in the care courts. That would save an awful lot of money. Now, they've got to be needed, therefore, because you've got to remember that they're merely an assistant to the court. It's the court that makes the decision. And the court, are quite, well, not that often, sometimes happens, particularly often, can completely ignore all the experts and decide that they think the parents or whoever are telling the truth and therefore the expert should be ignored. Remember too that the expert must be an expert. That's not to be understated because we've actually got statistics from the Expert Witness Institution to say that three quarters of all solicitors do not check up on the qualifications of their experts. Either they say or that they're actually qualified in the area upon which they're getting evidence. Immediately makes it inadmissible. We don't need it anyway. They're the basic rules on expert evidence. It's got to be relevant to the facts. It's got to be needed and it's got to be in the area of expertise. Now we have, to make a level playing field, to make it fair, 
We also have an evidential, I call it, safety valve. That is, you can't try to hoodwink or bamboozle the jury. In other words, any evidence which its prejudicial effect outweighs what it actually proves should be deemed inadmissible so the jury never hear it. That is an important safety valve, particularly in jury trial. And I don't think there's any research on it, but I don't think it's used that often. And it ought to be. Because what you've got to remember is that all these rules ensure a fair trial. And every defendant and every parent in the care course and every, what do they call them, defendant down the civil court, is entitled to a fair trial as of right now under the Human Rights Act. What that means is the first thing that a judge, prosecution and expert must do is they must ensure a fair trial. So that means that they owe a duty to ensure a fair trial above the duty to their client. So the expert must remember that it's not the overriding duty to his client who's paying him. It is the overriding duty to court and to justice to ensure a fair trial for these people so that we have a level playing field in an adversarial system and we don't play nasty. That has got us to what happened to Sally. I'm sure you're all well aware, and I'm not dwelling on too much on it, I'll just highlight the basic, basic thing. <coughs> Sally Clark, convicted of two murders, received two life sentences, went on two appeals, spent three years in prison. She died at 42, within four years of release. The evidence against her it was all expert opinion evidence. There was nothing else. And it was alleged that she had actually suffocated her babies. And we had pathology. I'm not going to go on too much about pathology because I'm sure people here know what one thing. The pathology, apparently, is sudden infant death syndrome. There are 300 each year. The pathology is very difficult to distinguish from suffocation. So it was difficult. It was the only evidence against her, because there was nothing else. She was there when they died. It, that was it. Now, the statistic given by Professor Meadows, as I'm sure you're all too well aware of, was that to have two sudden infant death deaths from cot death, sudden infant death syndrome, was one in 73 million. What a statistic. Now, he'd actually got that statistic from a dossier of, of uh, information that he prepared for the government. So he went into the witness box and gave that evidence. He reiterated the whole thing even more to the jury by saying, well, um, if you were to bet on an outsider in the Grand National for four years on the run, <coughs> on the run, consecutively, that would be your chance. The chance of having a cop death is the same as the chance of actually betting for four years consecutively on the Grand National and winning for four years. We all know the Grand National is the most unpredictable horse race you've ever got. So this was said to them. The rest of the evidence was eight other complex expert evidence that was largely incomprehensible, probably, to anybody who knew about it, but definitely to the jury. So clearly, if you were the juror that day, what would you have decided? Professor Meadows' sensational statistics and his comments about the Grand National, or a lot of contradictory, confusing expert evidence. Clearly, we know what happened. Two life sentences. But what we've got to decide is was that evidence admissible? In other words, 
did these people ensure a fair trial for Sally? The answer is no. Statistician evidence not admissible because Professor Meadows was not a statistician. It was outside his expertise. So it's a very simple open and shut case on that bit. In any event, it was not relevant because the statistics are based on deaths in separate families, not as with Sally in the same family. And lastly, but not leastly, our safety valve. We've just seen the evidence is inadmissible. In any event, had it been admissible, clearly the prejudicial effect of an incredibly important person who had given evidence in 5,000 or more previous um, trials, with the 87 child abuse books written, the foremost prominent person, is going to have a hugely prejudicial effect on the jury. Particularly, as we've established, it has no probative value at all because these two deaths were in the same family. So, what went wrong then? Why didn't these people ensure Sally had a fair trial? This gentleman has got a duty to ensure a fair trial. That means he's got a duty to exclude inadmissible evidence. He's also got a duty, if he thinks some evidence is going to be highly prejudicial, the jury shouldn't see it. What about the prosecution then? Wow, they relied on inadmissible evidence. They actually, Crown Prosecution Service, they had Professor Meadows there, they knew what the evidence was. They relied upon statistical evidence from somebody that wasn't a statistician. They relied on evidence to show one in 73 million one in fact. The chances of a cop death in the same family twice, according to the Royal Statistical Society, are more like 300 to 1. And some people say that it's much as 20 to 1 chance of having one, not one in 73 million. We also had a prosecution pathologist who sat on some microbiological um, results from, from the post-mortem that showed that Harry, one of the little boys, the Sally, actually had early meningitis from the fluid in his lungs and his spine. Now, the pathologist had that information of the trial. He did not reveal it to the prosecution barristers. It only came out after tenacious fights by the campaigners and by Sally's husband on the second appeal. There's no help from the Criminal Review Cases Committee, whatever it's called. Defence then, what did they do for their money? They made no objections. So they allowed in an admissible evidence. It was highly prejudicial. <coughs> Again, poor Sally was let down by the appeal system. And in fact, the Criminal Cases Review Committee. That's it, never mind that. She went on the first appeal. First appeal, they agreed because they'd had a letter from the Royal Statistical Association. Royal Statistical Association has said those statistics are ridiculous and it's more like one in 200, I think they said. So they clearly had to agree that the statistics were incorrect and not relevant and, I think we've got another one, not within Professor Meadows' expertise because he was not a statistician. So it ticks all three boxes of not being admissible. However, the Court of Appeal thought, little Professor Meadows Evans, he said, oh, mere distraction, minimal salute. How could that be a mere distraction when they've got no other evidence other than expert evidence? But that's what they decided. They reckon there's absolutely no possibility that the jury could have been misled. Right, 
So that's Coral Valley. Now, this was all repeated again two years later. Luckily for Angela and for Canny, she did come on the tail end of Sally. So it was a lot easier for her to um, show that the expert evidence might be wanting. Right, again two murders. Again she was given two life sentences. She spent 18 months in jail. She was four years separated from her daughter they shown, who actually had to then go and stay with her grandparents as soon as there was suspected abuse by her mum, and basically she's now divorced because of the strain on the relationship. Now, the most worrying thing in this case of <coughs> particularly Sally, Sally's truth, as we've said right at the beginning, with truth is dependent upon information. Sally's truth would not have come out had she not had a solicitor husband and awful lot of people behind her who were tenaciously determined to find evidence for a second appeal, which they did in the pathologist's report. Clearly, all these people that we're talking about, who I think probably would have problems in their basic evidence exam, are the best available in English law. They're the best experts, they're the best barristers, QCs, they are the best. They were also, to some extent, involved in some 258 convictions over the previous 10 years. Of those 258 convictions, only 28 were investigated, and there was only one where it was examined further and the person was actually released. Lisa Gore, I think she's called. Now, also, I know we can't talk about money, although commercial awareness has all but destroyed the legal profession. We have got an earning, roughly, there was 500,000 spent on Sally's defence team alone. So clearly, an estimate with all the appeals, roughly, you're talking three million pounds on all this. So, who was blamed? Wasn't the judge, wasn't the judicial, it wasn't the barristers, it was the expert. Which is rather weird because it's the actual prosecution that called the expert. It's the judge that allowed the expert's evidence. So it's a bit strange to blame him. Admittedly, he did owe a duty to actually um, ensure a fair trial, but he is merely the tool that was used. They blame the expert. What was the solution? The Criminal Evidence Expert Bill, 2011. Now, what that bill would do, as it does, as it does to me, I'm afraid, have shades of Leveson in the press. What that bill would do is say that we have a very weak presumption of expert reliability, but anybody, judge, anybody could object and make the person relying on the expert pass a statutory reliability test. So press would be subject to this sort of thing. Now, the statutory reliability test is as, as, as follows, which I find completely amazing. But I mean, I didn't see it's Penny Cooper asked me to write a thing in the uh, expert evidence witness. And that was the first time I actually saw this in 2010, and all the responses to the Law Commission report. And I thought, this is incredible. And yet the responses to the Law Commission report were all singing, dancing, and saying how wonderful it was. And I thought, this is extraordinarily dangerous from every viewpoint, constitutionally, rule of law, everything. 